Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. I like the background here. This is the thumbnail of the video that we're gonna to react to day two. It is called Islam and Ayahuasca Tripping with Allah. Psychedelic book review by the channel Your Brother Yusuf. So I have absolutely no idea who Brother Yusuf is. I just clicked on his video right now. To me, he looks like a revert. Maybe I'm judging him prematurely. However, the reason why I clicked on the video Islam and Ayahuasca is because I personally am a revert to Islam, alhamdulillah. And I have a lot of experiences with psychedelics in the past. I dabbled in the New Age, Buddhism, Hinduism, Shamanism, all kinds of psychedelics. I even went to the Amazon jungle and drank the Cool Aid with the shamans myself. So therefore this combination is pretty unique. So I'm curious to hear what he has to say. But guys, before we jump into the video, as always, if you enjoy my content, leave me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check out the links in the description box below to further support my work. And now, with no further ado, let's have a look. For a lot of Muslims, if not the vast majority, mind-altering psychedelic plant substances like ayahuasca, iboga, and psilocybin mushrooms are drugs, and drugs are prohibited. Yeah. For others, however, it's not such a simple issue, and there's actually a lot more to the story. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Today we're going to be talking about the dialogue between Islamic traditions and psychedelic substances, especially ayahuasca. And we're also going to review a fascinating and unique book entitled Tripping with Allah by Michael Muhammad Knight, which, as you will see, is going to align beautifully with the rest yeah, well, of the discussion the title is and a bring bit triggering. everything into focus, yeah. including a number I wouldn't of have phrased it that way. issues. At the end of the video, I'll tell you what I think about the book itself and whether or not I recommend reading it yourself. I just want to say I appreciate the optic of the video. This is how I made videos back in the day, in the early stages of my channel. Let's talk about why psychedelics are considered haram in Islam. Sure. Allah says in the Quran that gambling and intoxicants are Satan's handiwork, so we yep. should avoid them to be successful. We see lines about intoxication in the Hadith literature as well. In one authentic narration, it was reported that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said that all intoxicants are unlawful. And in another, it was reported that every intoxicant is khamer and every khamer is forbidden. I see where so if we take psychedelics as intoxicants, we can easily see how that's really the end of the story. But we might also see how it might not be the end of the story if we were to hold the perspective that psychedelics are not, in fact, intoxicants. Yeah, absolutely. And this is really the question, because if I look back into my past, I talked about this extensively previously on my channel, I have to tiptoe around it a bit because of YouTube, you cannot really speak your mind over here, but I had a lot of experiences with psychedelics and other substances, let's call them that. And I can guarantee you, I can assure you that psychedelics are like no other substance. And if we talk about intoxicants, if we talk about toxic substances, obviously alcohol is toxic. It is toxic to the body. It is a neurotoxin by definition. However, if you look into DMT, this is the molecule that is occurring in ayahuasca, or into psilocybin, which breaks down to a similar component of DMT. Those molecules are actually endogenous to the human body. You produce them yourself. Certain scientists came to the conclusion that you produce DMT when you are sleeping. So those are not foreign substances, let alone toxic substances to your body. There are certain plants, certain plant medicines, if you will, that alter your consciousness into a state that is naturally occurring as well, depending on the state of mind, depending on the time of the day even. As I said, if you're sleeping, you might be tripping. Or of course, if you look into certain meditative practices as well, people can evoke those altered states of consciousness naturally too. And so therefore, it is not even scientifically accurate to label those substances as intoxicants, because they simply are not. To consider that perspective, I think it's critically important that we talk about approaching this issue in good faith. And what I mean by that is that if we want to meaningfully discuss something like ayahuasca and the people who drink it, we really need to at least acknowledge how they see it and how they understand it. That way, even if you watch this and you come away with an understanding that none of this has any place in Islam or for Muslims who should just stay away from it, 
at least you will have done so after you've considered it on its own terms and instead of just applying a blanket label to something that you don't understand or know much about. Yeah, see, he tries to be very careful here for the Sharia police in the comments. Ultimately, you have many close-minded people and they simply cannot discuss anything whatsoever that goes against their biases. And therefore, even if you just give a book review or you consider a specific fact that they see as haram, you cannot talk about it whatsoever without getting a stop. As Allah says, we were made different so we could know each other. So, who are yeah, the male people female. who drink ayahuasca? And for those watching who don't know, what is ayahuasca? Well, ayahuasca is a traditional psychoactive drink used by indigenous peoples in the Amazon basin, particularly in Peru, Brazil, yep. Colombia, and Ecuador That's where for I was. spiritual and healing purposes. The brew is typically made from two main components. First is Psychotria viridis, also known as Chacruna leaf, and this plant contains dimethyltryptamine, a powerful hallucinogenic substance. DMT is, incidentally, also made by the pineal glands of our own oh, exactly. brains, and some theories hold that it plays a natural role in dreaming and near-death experiences. The second ingredient in ayahuasca is Banisteriopsis capi, aka the ayahuasca vine. This vine contains monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which allow the psychoactive compounds in the chacruna leaf to remain bioactive in the body without getting prematurely broken down. Yeah, when otherwise combined, you just pee it out, basically. These two plants create a brew that induces altered states of consciousness, often leading to intense visual and emotional experiences for a four to six hour period. Ayahuasca has been traditionally used under the supervision of a skilled facilitator in shamanic ceremonies for healing, divination, and spiritual insight. Participants often report profound personal revelations, increased self-awareness, and a visceral sense of connection to the divine. In recent years, ayahuasca has gained popularity outside of its traditional context, with people around the world seeking it out for potential psychological and spiritual benefits. Not only is Physical ayahuasca now as well. used That's ceremonially all over the world, but it's also been getting more attention for clinical effectiveness in treating PTSD and perhaps ironically, depending on your perspective, drug addiction as well. The award-winning author and doctor Gabor Mate. Exactly right. Ooh. Yeah, and that's exactly my point, because you have many people that are actually addicted to toxic substances, such as opiates, alcohol, pain medicines, and whatnot. And then they actually try psychedelics, plant medicines, call them what you will, as a therapeutic healing method. And guess what? They stop their addictive behavior. So they get away from substances by actually consuming this particular plant. And therefore, to mesh them into the same category does not work whatsoever. Yes, I am aware there are some people that go to parties and they pop some asses and they take some magic and whatnot. I get it. But in a medicinal setting, those plants actually take you away from substance abuse. Works with severely traumatized drug addicts in Vancouver has used ayahuasca in his work of consistently helping people to recover from both trauma and addiction. No, there you Actually, go. ayahuasca is not unique in this regard. Iboga, another psychoactive plant from West Africa with totally different psychoactive chemistry, has a scientifically proven track record of getting people off of street drugs like heroin and even curing opiate withdrawal symptoms. It's important to understand that generally speaking, there is nothing recreational or fun about an ayahuasca ceremony yeah, and people who go true. to them tend to take them very seriously there is a popular cliche that one night of ayahuasca can resemble a thousand hours of psychotherapy yeah it's a very crucial point to be made i totally forgot about this because it has been years since i touched psychedelics it's never fun. Matter of fact, you're always afraid before you do it. It's not something that you do recreationally. You don't go to a bar and have a drink or you go to a coffee shop and smoke a joint. It's not about enjoyment whatsoever. After ingesting ayahuasca, many people start puking. They start crying their pants, quite literally. It can be absolutely horrific. And as he mentioned, it replaces thousands of hours of psychotherapy. Yes, because being on ayahuasca feels like you're trapped in eternity. 
time and space dissolve completely and the experience just drags on. You can find yourself in an absolute horror loop of infinity. It is not pleasant whatsoever. So the question becomes, of course, why do you do that? Now we just see the beautiful graphics in the background, but it's not just like that. If it was just visuals, then everybody would do it recreationally, as I just said. No, people return to it because they find physical, spiritual, mental healing within this journey that they partake in once they ingested those psychedelics. So yet again, I don't see those substances as intoxicants either here. I see them as therapeutic healing methods that are, however, not for everyone. In other words, even if the experience can include psychoactive effects, it is certainly not about intoxication or escapism the way that alcohol or cannabis might be. Yeah, to zero. put it another way, the people who use it generally do not see it as a drug and will often refer to it as medicine, yeah. the medicine, or la medicina. It's also something that people might do once or maybe a few times in their life. Yeah, so matter of fact, sorry guys, I have to interrupt the video again, but a matter of fact, when I was in Colombia, first I was in Peru and I drank the ayahuasca with the shamans, then I was in Colombia, and you have no idea how many housewives I met at those ayahuasca ceremonies. Simple, normal housewives that don't consume any drugs, but they go to those ayahuasca retreats, to those ayahuasca ceremonies, call them what you will, to heal themselves of certain ailments. Because for them it is la medicina. That's it. It's just a medicinal ritual, if you will. It does not seem to be habit forming or physiologically addictive not, definitely in not. any way whatsoever. <laughs> you can't do now, that. Now, so every far, day. if you still think this type of substance or experience has absolutely no place whatsoever in a Muslim's toolbox, even if they cannot find solutions for addiction or trauma, I don't blame you. My own story is not that I was a Muslim who came to ayahuasca, but rather that I was actively involved in going to ayahuasca ceremonies for about six years mm. before I came to Islam. Yeah, in fact, to the years of my life that I spent drinking ayahuasca for my own healing reasons directly preceded taking shahada. I'm not going to say that I became Muslim as a result of my ayahuasca experiences, but I can accurately say that those experiences did lead up to me becoming Muslim at least on a chronological level. Same here. So while I am... I would agree here with him with the chronological development, but I would have to add here that the spiritual experiences that I made with ayahuasca, with psilocybin and mushrooms, definitely showed me the oneness of God, the understanding of the oneness of God. And therefore, when I started looking into other religions, such as Christianity, and I found the concept of the Trinity, I simply couldn't believe it because I already saw the truth on ayahuasca, if you will. And I knew in my heart that God is one. So therefore, I wouldn't say that it was due to ayahuasca that I reverted to Islam. However, it played a role for sure. Ayahuasca, I am speaking on this issue from a personal experience in my pre-Muslim life as someone who never saw it as a drug and personally experienced a tremendous amount of self-discovery as well as healing from my own trauma and addiction issues. Right. I felt like it had given me a lot. So naturally, when I became Muslim, I was curious if there was any dialogue between psychedelic plant medicine traditions, ayahuasca or otherwise, and the religion of Islam that I was rapidly falling in love with. But some fast googling didn't turn up much, if really any overlap at all, with one major exception. This book. And since it was the only thing I could find, I ordered I it pretty this. quickly without knowing anything about it and knowing even less about its author. And boy oh boy, was I in for one of the most shocking and outrageous literary experiences of my life. Let's talk about the author first, because he really is a unique and truly fascinating individual. Michael Muhammad Knight is an American author, a PhD in Islamic studies, and a journalist known for his groundbreaking work on contemporary Islam in the West. He gained notoriety with his debut novel, The Taqwa Corps, in 2004, which then became a foundational text for the American Muslim punk rock movement. The book was adapted Muslim to punk both rock. a feature film and a documentary. That's so Since weird, but I don't understand how punks always find their way into religion, so I never heard about the Muslim punk rock scene in the US. But they had an orthodox Christian punk rock scene as well. Matter of fact, they called themselves death to the world. Because the orthodox Christians proclaimed death to the world, a lifestyle where you abstain from the world. 
and you focus on the hereafter. But somehow the punks saw that as the ultimate anti-establishment revolutionary movement that they could adapt and therefore it became Orthodox Christian punk death to the world. Muslim punk rock movement. The book was adapted to both a feature film and a documentary. Since then, Knight has written extensively on Islamic culture, history, and identity, often exploring themes of hybridity and the experiences of Muslims in the United States, to date having published more than a dozen full-length books. His work challenges well, traditional narratives and has earned him a reputation as a He's provocative a and innovative voice in Islamic studies. Many have called him the Hunter S. Thompson of Islamic literature. His book, Tripping with Allah, Islam, Drugs, and Writing is a unique and introspective exploration of the intersections interesting. between Islamic interesting. spirituality, I have to admit I'm judging it kind of, I'm judging the, the book process. by its cover, so In this book, Knight goes deep into his personal experiences with hallucinogens as a means to explore his relationship with Islam, examining how altered states of consciousness can influence religious belief and practice. The book blends memoir, religious inquiry, and literary criticism, offering a candid and unconventional perspective on how sacred experiences can be found in unexpected places. Throughout this work, Knight challenges readers to reconsider the boundaries between the sacred and the profane, and along the way, the book has complete chapters on different psychoactive substances throughout the history of the Muslim world. For example, in his chapter on cannabis, Michael Muhammad Knight highlights the ambiguity surrounding the use of cannabis in the history of Islamic law, noting okay. that it was never explicitly mentioned by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or by the founders of the four major Sunni schools, Imams Shafi'i, Malik, Abu Hanifa, and Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Yeah, okay, but that's very vague, simply saying it was never mentioned. I'm pretty sure that fentanyl wasn't mentioned by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam either. So therefore, there are, of course, many more drugs to come in this world that weren't mentioned back in the day. But then we have to come to certain fatwas, certain rulings that were previously established, of course. So this is definitely not a good argument, man. Regardless, Hashish was a significant part of life in the Muslim world long before its introduction to Europe. And as Islam spread to regions like India and Persia, local cultures continued their cannabis use even after converting to the religion. Knight points out that cannabis use was sometimes explicitly permitted, such as in a fatwa by the 9th century Hanafi judge Jamaat ad din Yusuf ibn Musa al-Malati and by Shafi'i scholar Az Zarkashi who stated that small quantities of hashish were permissible. In some instances, prohibitions against cannabis were considered bidda, or innovation, as forbidding something not expressly prohibited by Islamic law was itself seen as forbidden. Sufis, known for their diverse and mystical practices, referred to hashish as musilat al-qalb, the one that connects the heart, and Ziyarat al-Kidr, visit of the green Kidr. A legend even credits the Sufi saint Sheikh Haydar with discovering cannabis. Knight suggests that opposition to hashish often stemmed yeah, okay. more- Yeah, I mean, there you have it, right? So if they credit this specific Sufi Sheikh with the discovery of cannabis, that would then imply that it wasn't around during the time of the Prophet wasallam, And therefore you have to come up with a ruling and that ruling then will be new, if you will, because that substance back then did not exist. From class dynamics than legal concerns, as it was associated with the poor and marginalized. Going so far as to draw parallels between the treatment of outsider Sufi groups criticized by people like Ibn Taymiyyah and marginalized racial groups in the modern United States of America. In his chapter on coffee, Knight explores the historical significance of coffee within Islamic exactly. culture, tracing its example. origins and the controversies it sparked among Muslim scholars and communities. Coffee was also unheard of in the Prophet Muhammad's time, peace right. be upon him, but after emerging from Ethiopia, it reached Yemen, and soon after that, it exploded throughout the Middle East and the rest of the Muslim world. The world's first coffee house opened in Damascus in 1530, and within a 10-year period, the empire saw more than 600 coffee houses established far and wide. In Mecca, Coffee saw its first formal opposition in 1511, when Khair Beg al Mimar, Pasha of the Mamluks, called an assembly of jurists to make a ruling. At the meeting, he had two doctors testify that it was harmful to its consumer, 
and the drink was subsequently officially outlawed by the panel. In 1517, Ottomans conquered Mecca and coffee became legal again, but in 1580, it would once again become declared a forbidden substance throughout the holy city, in fact, placed in the same category as wine. Again, as with cannabis, Knight argues that coffee's ban had less to do with legal definitions of intoxication and more to do with who was drinking it and issues of culture and class. After all, coffee houses gave forum to poetry, dancing, music, and Sufi gatherings that were associated with unsavory lifestyles and considered threatening to the integrity of the state. Knight also oh, gets into the sense. symbolic role of coffee in Sufi rituals where it was sometimes used to enhance spiritual focus and endurance during long sessions of dhikr. Yeah, this further complicated the religious discourse that. around coffee, as in many cases, it became directly intertwined with mystical Islamic practices. In other words, it wasn't just drank by Muslims, but rather it was an integral part of their Islam. Like cannabis, coffee also came to Europe only after it was widespread in the Muslim world. And also like cannabis, there were a range Say of legal thanks to the Muslims, Europeans and opposing coffee. You love your coffee. But don't unlike you? cannabis, the mainstream culture ended up including it as allowable instead of pushing it out as haram. And of course, today there is even a Starbucks right across from the Prophet's mosque in Medina. Knight yeah, even opens Starbucks, up the right? complex and often contradictory relationship between Islam and alcohol. He begins by discussing the gradual, four-stage prohibition of wine in the Qur'an. First, it's described as both beneficial and harmful, but ultimately more bad than good, and eventually it is banned from Muslims outright. This phased prohibition is rooted in the idea that intoxicants impair judgment and hinder spiritual growth, making alcohol incompatible with Islamic principles and a life of worship. It's true. Stories go, that when the final verses prohibiting wine were revealed, people would be seen literally pouring out half-drunk bottles of wine in the street, swearing it off for good. Knight goes on to investigate the historical and cultural contexts in which alcohol has appeared in the Muslim world despite the religious ban. He highlights how alcohol consumption has been a point of contention among Muslim communities, with some individuals and societies strictly adhering to the prohibition while others have found ways to navigate or even circumvent it, even among the highest levels sure. of political power and In influence, Turkey, such as the, the Ottoman Sultans, to cite just one example. Yeah, he also points out that the towering hero of American Islam, Malcolm X, started drinking rum and coke after his famously documented Hajj pilgrimage. And the legendary Ibn Sino was, as Knight puts it, unapologetic in his love for wine and actually died while mixing alcohol with opium. In the canonized yeah. Sufi poetry of Rumi, Attar, Yunus Emre, and so on, wine is referred to abundantly, although these references are generally metaphorical. Yeah, okay, but all of this is not a good argument either because ultimately you're just listing people and those people were flawed and they fell for the alcohol then because Quranically speaking, alcohol is prohibited. That's just what it is. And therefore, if we don't go by the Quran, what do we go by then? The author even points out that traditional Sunni legal rulings on alcohol are not quite as unanimous as people think saying that, quote, according to Abu Hanifa, one of the great legal scholars of Sunni tradition, you can drink, but don't get intoxicated. And you're not to be there considered was the intoxicated first ruling, yep. unless you can no longer tell the difference between the sky and the earth or between a man and a woman. To be clear, Knight's commentary is not yeah, intended not that easy. to argue that alcohol is somehow permissible, but only, I think, that the history of actual Muslim life is quite a bit more complicated than the history of Islamic jurisprudence. To put it differently, even sure. an issue as apparently black and white as alcohol has shades of grey if you allow that the history of real Muslims living their lives is, on some level, inseparable from the history of the religion as a more pure abstraction transcending individual life. Yeah, I personally wouldn't base it on that because, as I said already, those are people and we shouldn't base the religion on people because we always say Islam is perfect, Muslims are not. 
And the same applies, of course, to any other religion. If you look at the behavior of a group of people, it doesn't necessarily reflect the teachings of the religion. And therefore, I do not doubt, of course, that the Muslim societies over the eons were not perfect. It is just what it is. Surely there was zina, there was consumption of alcohol and all kinds of other sins because humans are humans. But this is not the religion. Therefore, we shouldn't water it down and blurry the lines and make Islam basically everything and anything. No, we know that alcohol is most definitely prohibited within Islam. This is the common orthodox understanding, no matter what Muslims chose to do or not to do. In the autobiographical narrative portion of the story, Michael Muhammad Knight's first personal exposure to ayahuasca comes by way of the Santo Daime, a syncretic Brazilian Brazil. spiritual tradition that blends Catholicism, African religions, and Amazonian shamanism, particularly through the use of ayahuasca in religious ceremonies. The author, who is also the protagonist, is drawn to Santo Daime because it challenges traditional religious boundaries by using a psychoactive substance as a sacrament. Furthermore, he specifically takes an interest in a comparison between the importance of feminine iconography in traditional Amazonian ayahuasca cultures, where the vine itself is conceived as a maternal spirit, known as mother or grandmother ayahuasca, and the Santo Daime, where the Virgin Mary, or Queen of the Forest, is venerated within a decidedly Christian framework. Knight notes that in contrast to Orthodox Islam, these two traditions conceptualize the divine feminine as central pillars of their cosmology, either as raw natural power or through established religious symbolism. In order to find some kind of parallel between the central use of feminine symbolism in traditional indigenous ayahuasca cultures, the Santo Daime and Islam, so he can engage with ayahuasca without borrowing those symbols, Michael Muhammad Knight ties the concept of archetypal feminine iconography to Fatima, the wife of Ali and the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For Knight, Fatima perfectly embodies the sacred feminine within Islam. The book reflects quite extensively on Fatima as a powerful maternal figure in Islamic tradition, revered not only for her piety and purity, but also as a symbol of spiritual authority and protection. He draws parallels between Fatima and the feminine archetypes he explores in ayahuasca cultures and Santo Daime, noting that, like Mother Ayahuasca or the Virgin Mary, Fatima represents a nurturing, guiding presence that can offer spiritual insight and support. In the story, Fatima effectively bridges the gap between the sacred feminine in Islam and these other traditions, suggesting that despite differences in religious context, there is a universal aspect to the veneration of feminine figures as sources of spiritual wisdom and healing. By linking Fatima to these other feminine archetypes, Knight highlights the shared human impulse to seek out and revere the divine feminine across different cultures and religious practices. Michael Muhammad Knight also points out that he's not the first to make this connection. In fact, there is a whole Sufi order that uses both ayahuasca and the image of Fatima as central in its ceremonial and mystical practices. Yes, it's true. The Fatimiya Sufi order is a contemporary Sufi order with deep Yeah, Persian sure, but now we're talking about another Australia sect again, right? That emerged with a focus on integrating traditional Sufi practices with modern spirituality. The order emphasizes the importance of love, service, and devotion to Allah, aligning with the broader Sufi traditions of seeking a direct experiential connection with the divine. Perhaps analogous to the incorporation of coffee and, to a lesser degree, cannabis by Sufi orders of antiquity, ayahuasca is used by the Fatimiya order as a religious sacrament to facilitate deep spiritual experiences, personal healing, and spiritual connection. Now, the use of ayahuasca in a Sufi context is obviously unconventional, if not unprecedented, yep. as traditional Sufi practices generally do not involve any hallucinogenic substances. However, the Fatimiya Sufi order sees this as a way to explore the depths of spiritual consciousness and healing, blending ancient wisdom with modern approaches to spirituality. This integration Ayahuasca of Ayahuasca is not with modern Islamic either. framework reflects a broader trend of cultural exchange and spiritual experimentation 
in contemporary global religious practices. Yes, yeah, interesting and fascinating this is, it is still problematic, of course, because ultimately all the mentions of Islam are always based upon certain fringe sects or certain people. He did that, they did that, this order, the Sufi order is doing this now. This doesn't tell us about orthodox Islam, because if we go back into the past, of course, we can find all kinds of Muslims practicing all kinds of things. He mentioned certain sultans and drinking alcohol. There were certain sultans that were homosexuals, admittedly. And such arguments are used by liberal Muslims nowadays to then claim, yeah, well, see, in Islamic history, there was poetry about homosexuality, and therefore, isn't this proof that homosexuality has a place in Islam? I would say no, of course, because it's not orthodox Islam. Orthodox Islam itself is the way that it has been established by the Prophet wasallam, And then you have people and their vices and their practices and people being people, as I said already. So therefore, I find it a very, very bad example if we take later innovations and say then, well, this is Islam as well, because it certainly is not. This is people, yet again. The climax of Tripping with Allah is Knight's own personal ayahuasca experience, which the rest of the book all leads up to. And I must say, this chapter is beyond intense and an extreme literary tour de force by any measure. Not only is it probably the best narrative description of a psychedelic experience I've ever read, but reading it felt like a psychedelic experience in itself. One thing I love about the chapter is that it reads like something impossible to forge. It seems like, while the details could certainly have been embellished, especially by such a skilled storyteller, they could not completely have been fabricated. This guy definitely lived what he's writing about. Sure, sure. The pages that describe Knight's ayahuasca experience are exploding with jaw-dropping imagery, deep personal confessions, emotional extremes. You get the impression that ayahuasca combined all of his Islamic education, his personal relationships to Fatima, Ali, Hussein, Muhammad peace be upon him and his troubled relationship with Allah and with the Quran and revealed exactly how his head full of Islamic symbolism interlocks with his own subjective personhood and all the experiences that shaped him. But by the end of this well, dizzying car crash of visions, tears, feelings, realizations, epiphanies, relived traumas and cathartic unfoldings, resolution does finally arrive and an overwhelmingly transformative experience of healing does descend on the protagonist. The sense is that ayahuasca completely disassembles him and shows him to himself before putting him back together more whole, self-aware, and healed than ever. What's fascinating about the end of this book is that the morning after his ayahuasca experience, Knight visits a masjid and finds his love of exoteric Islamic expressions revitalized. And in the period of his life following the psychedelic episode, he actually finds himself diving back into a traditionally good, observant Muslim man more wholeheartedly than ever, even expressing a renewed love for the Prophet, peace be upon him, and a love for following the details of his sunnah in a very orthodox, normative way. So yep, while Knight is fully understand. aware that much of the thought and experience chronicled in this book could be completely condemned by many, if not most Muslims, the irony is that it all brings him back to a pretty purified and earnest relationship with a fully respectable and orthodox Islamic lifestyle. Mm. In fact, the next book he wrote after this would be Why I Am a Salafi. Personally, <laughs> I have now read three of Michael Muhammad Knight's <laughs> books, including Tripping with Allah, but also Muhammad, the 40 Hadith Collection, as well as Who is Muhammad more recently. And every single one of them mentions the ayahuasca experience that is fully chronicled in Tripping with Allah, which I believe is a clear testament to how much it has impacted him, even a year later. So now finally, having discussed a lot of the contents of okay. this book... Okay. Oh, right, guys, and I'm gonna cut it off here. It was a very, very interesting watch, actually more interesting than I expected it to be. And I definitely have to read those books as well for my personal education and entertainment. That being said, watching this video, I really want to shout out the channel Your Brother Yusuf yet again. He actually made a bunch of videos on Islam and Ayahuasca, and he does other videos as well, talking about him being a revert, etc. But moreover, Brother Yusuf, if you're watching, I want to invite you to my live stream. I believe we could have a fascinating discussion about Ayahuasca, psychedelics, Islam, reverting to Islam, and the audiences would surely love it. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. If you enjoyed it, leave it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and check out the links in the description box below to further support my work. And as always, may God bless you all. 
Much love and peace. Ya nafsu illam tadfari la tajzai Ah